It's pronounced canon, not cannot. But when you have an ongoing universe that gets new entries on the semi-reg, maintaining narrative cohesion can get tedious. A great case study for this is the Alien franchise. I've always been really into Alien, and I think the new one, Alien Romulus, was pretty banging. I mean, it was a well-done movie in general, but I'm more impressed with how it managed to address the rest of the franchise and tie up so many loose ends. I felt similarly about Deadpool Wolverine, so this video is kind of a spiritual sequel to that one, just me glazing, plain and simple. The one thing I find more impressive than an intelligently written movie is an intelligently written sequel that elevates what came before, a story that picks up on previously established threads, some of which, mind you, were considerably frayed, and weaves them into a satisfying little woven thing. And that's exactly what I think Alien Romulus is. But first, a rundown of the story leading up to Romulus. The original 1979 film was written by Dan O'Bannon and directed by Ridley Scott. In the relatively near future, the Weyland yutani Corporation is doing corporate stuff in space. One corporate starship, Nostromo, is returning from a supply drop when it gets pinged with mysterious orders. The crew has been instructed to investigate a strange planet called LV-426. So they touch down on the planet and find a crashed alien ship. What's on the ship? Exhibit A, large freaky humanoid, deceased. Exhibit B, large freaky eggs, not deceased. One of them opens up and a creature jumps out and latches onto a guy's face. And it comes off after a while and he thinks he's fine, but at the midpoint of the movie, an alien hatches out of his chest. The Xenomorph, as it is known, proceeds to pick off the Nostromo's crew one by one. While this is happening, it's revealed that one of the crew was a robot who knew about the alien all along or something, but he dies too. The last survivor is this lady named Warrant Officer Ripley. Ripley blows the Xenomorph out of the airlock and blasts it with the exhaust. It's no longer a problem. Now she's lost in space and she goes into cryo sleep with her cat and that's the end of the movie. So the second movie is Aliens Plural. Ripley's ship gets found and she's woken up by other humans. She learns that it's been 57 years since the Xenomorph incident. Nobody believes her when she tells them what happened. And what's more, LV-426 has been colonized. There are people there, on the alien planet, and they haven't been answering our calls. So the corporation sends a military detachment down to investigate, and Ripley goes with them as a consultant. It turns out the aliens have completely taken over the colony. Whereas in the first film it was just one, now there are thousands crawling about. The sole survivor of the Xeno takeover is this little kid named Newt. She's been living in the air vents. Now, a little BTS. Aliens suffered some serious cuts because Fox wanted it to be 90 minutes. The most abhorrent of these cuts, in my opinion, was the scene where we learn Ripley had a a daughter who lived an entire life and died while she was in cryosleep. Ripley was essentially robbed of her motherhood by the company and by the alien. While it's explored in the director's cut, this thread is absent from the theatrical and it's such a shame because a good chunk of the movie is Ripley bonding with this kid and then the end of the movie is her going back into the colony, which is about to blow up alone to save the kid. And she has to fight the mother of the aliens, the queen, and it's a whole thing. Aliens also has another super interesting synthetic character called Bishop and this colonial marine guy named Hicks. Really all of these supporting characters in this movie are fantastic, which is why Alien 3 is so hated. Because Hicks and Newt literally die at the very beginning. I know it's just entertainment, but just like certain narrative choices feel like sacrilegious and abominable to me, and this is one of them. And that's the beginning of the movie. And then it's something something prison planet, and then Ripley dies because she was carrying an alien queen. And then there's Alien 4, Ripley comes back as a clone, but it's 200 years later, and it's like, what are we doing here? Okay, then in 2011, there was this movie called Promethazine, set decades before the first movie, back when the founder of the Wayland yutani Corporation, Peter Wayland, was still alive. Wayland wants to know the secret to immortality, so he travels with a bunch of scientists to an alien planet that has some links to creation myths. Remember the big dead guy on the original abandoned ship from the first movie? It turns out he was a member of the species that created humans, the engineers. Peter Wayland decides to wake up the only surviving engineer who was in a stasis pod. The engineer stumbles to his feet and, after explaining his skincare routine, promptly begins killing people, starting with Wayland. Bear in mind, there are no xenomorphs in Prometheus. Instead, the focus is on this weird black goo bioweapon that turns life into freaky life. 
It turns out the engineers had planned on wiping humans out using the black goo, but before they could leave, they spilled some and infected themselves, and that's why they're all dead. But now the one surviving engineer wants to complete his mission, which was destroying Earth, but the scientists stop him by crashing a thing into the thing. And after all is said and done, the only survivors are the final girl, Elizabeth, and her android, David. Remember, this is a prequel, so the obedient, emotionless androids from the first couple Alien movies haven't been created yet. David is an early prototype, and he is a freak. He is emotional, he's philosophical, and he is morbidly curious about the alien bioweapon and its effects. So most of the antics in Prometheus stem from David sabotaging the crew and poking around where he shouldn't be. Elizabeth doesn't know what David did though, so after the conflict is over, she stitches his head back on and the two hop onto an alien ship and zoom off to go explore the secrets of the universe. The final image of the movie is a creature that looks sort of like the original alien bursting out of the dead engineer. There are two main criticisms of Prometheus. One is that the scientist characters are really dumb. The other is that it doesn't fully commit to being a prequel. After this movie came out, I remember a lot of people theorizing about what exactly the alien family tree slash life cycle was. It was annoying that the movie just created more questions and more loose ends. Then Alien Covenant came out out in like 2017 and tangled the knot even more. This sixth installment introduced yet another new cast and a new final girl. This time it's a colony mission that lands on the Engineer homeworld, which is a different planet from the Prometheus planet. That was just an Engineer outpost. This is their actual homeworld. But all the Engineers on the homeworld are also dead and the sole inhabitant of the planet is David. You following? Which means Elizabeth is also dead. She was a cool character, but David killed her. Turns out he also killed the engineers the moment he landed because they made humans and he hates humans. This guy is crazy. And remember the black goo? Yeah, it's kind of everywhere on this planet. It's part of the ecosystem. It gets in people's ears and aliens burst out of them, but they're not the same aliens. They look a little different. That it's like, did David create the xenomorphs? Is that what we're going with? But that doesn't make sense because the engineers were shown to have worshipped the xenomorphs in Prometheus. They built statues of them Look, I, I don't like Covenant very much. But the gist is, it ends with David escaping the planet by disguising himself as the company android Walter. And David has hella alien life forms in tow, plus two captive humans, and the ending is like, OMG, what's David gonna do? Nobody knows. So, seven years later, it's time for a new alien movie. The mission is simple. Get people to like this franchise again. We can do anything we want. The whiteboard is empty, our minds are open. Alien 7, what's the move? Well, we do have a blank canvas, but also this is a popular franchise. There are a lot of elements that people do like, so let's just start by stealing from ourselves a bit. Let's sift through the previous six movies and figure out what stays and what goes. How's that sound? Yep, sounds like a plan. So what do people like about the original Alien? The premise, one monster versus a group of competent humans in a contained space. Yeah, when there's just one alien creeping around, it really becomes a slasher movie and makes the threat feel so much scarier. Okay, so one alien, one alien. Uh, now, what do people like about aliens, plural? Oh, it's a war movie. Yeah, there's a bunch of aliens. It's overwhelming and it's terrifying and they're just everywhere. Wait, so which is better? One alien or a ton of them? Oh, uh, you know, they're both cool in their own ways. Yeah, but which one do we do, though? And why not both? both? Yeah, for part of the movie, there's only one, and we get the slasher vibe, but then later on, a bunch more show up, and it becomes a shooting gallery. That sounds like a good start. Really, the first two Alien movies are absolute gold. I know, right? We can recycle anything from those. Shit, let's bring back Ripley. Uh... What? Yeah, we don't want to touch Alien 3 or Alien 4. We could just retcon them, you know, pick up with Ripley after Aliens. Yeah, but then we're in the Ripley box. She's like her own character, and then we have to... I think we should just drop that and do an original story. What? Just clear the deck with a brand new cast again? We just did that twice. Nobody liked it. Yeah, but what if the original story was good? Oh shit, yeah, I forgot that was an option. So, original story, new group of scientists. Wait, wait, wait. scientists? Again? Yeah, what's wrong with scientists? Well, they're fine, but the average viewer's life doesn't revolve around the pursuit of knowledge and discovery. The casts of the last two Alien movies weren't relatable because they consisted of high-minded corporate people doing high-minded corporate stuff. So, we do a we working, do a working class, class thing. thing. 
Honestly, that was kind of the first one too. Yeah, instead of the Wayland yutani scientists, it's about the Wayland yutani grunts seeking a better life. Bingo. So wait, is there nothing worth taking from Prometheus and Covenant? Nah, I don't think so. Let's just do good old-fashioned Xeno madness. Back to basics. No, you know, I, I disagree. I can understand pretending Alien 3 and Alien 4 never happened, but we sank a lot of time and money into Prometheus and Covenant quite recently. We added whole dimensions to this world. Yeah, the stories didn't really click with people on a human level, but we spun up some really interesting storylines and reshaped the conversation around Alien Forever. I feel like we can't go back on those. <sighs> Ugh. But the goo was so stupid. Why is it goo? Why can't it just be an alien species? I don't know, but that's just what we're dealing with here. Okay, well, let's just figure out how the aliens work once and for all. So, just recap. Elizabeth gave birth to the trilobites, which then impregnated the engineer, and the one that came out was a semi-alien, or maybe it just depends on the host organism, like with no, the dogs. No, 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 stop. Like, even if we did clean up that mess, the answer wouldn't be satisfying. It would just be a big stupid family tree, and then what? Who cares? If the prequels happened, then the alien life cycle is complicated and messy. And we're not throwing out the prequels, so I just say, fuck it. The alien life cycle is complicated and messy. The, the goo, goo does, does weird, weird stuff, stuff to life, to life forms. Nobody knows how it works. You never know what you're going to get with the goo. It's like a genetic mishmash. You just know something freaky is going to happen. We just lean into the ambiguity of it all. Lean in. If we can't fix the mess, we own the mess. The mess makes it scarier. Okay, okay, so our, our poor people, let's just say they're trying to escape the planet. Word. And to do that, they have to get something that's on board a ship. Love it. And the ship has an alien on it, so they break into the ship and they have to deal with the alien. Perfectionary. Yeah, so we need a final girl, obviously. A few flavor characters. Yep, yep. And we always do a synthetic, right? Yeah, so David round three. We could do David. He was the one good through line of the last two movies, but those were prequels. And is there really much else for him to do as a character? Yeah, okay, so new synthetic. Good or evil? Well, hold on. We don't just include these synthetic characters for fun, we use them to explore themes that we couldn't with human characters. Questions about consciousness, the soul, what it means to be human. True. So we do that. But instead of sidelining those themes in favor of some vague creation myth shit, we just make the movie about those themes. Consciousness, the soul, what it means to be human. I like that because it's like, are we truly unique or are we just like the alien goo? A churning wave of biomass spreading out blindly across the universe, grasping at every chance to propagate itself, indifferent to its own suffering and the suffering of that which it touches. Why is the perfect organism without a soul? Could it be perhaps that our consciousness is vestigial, that our sense of self is the mental equivalent of an appendix, and that our true nature is no different from that of the alien? And what better device to explore this question than the synthetic, allegedly soulless people that already exist in this universe? So it's Final Girl and her friend the android. Delectable. And the big question of our movie is, does he have a soul? Does he? Yeah, we did a sad ending last time, and the time before that if you're just going off canon. So, happy ending. Happy ending! The android has a soul, and the final girl saves him, just like when Ripley went to save Newt. Love it! And then the android and the final girl escape the trash planet. Happy ending, fuck yeah. Okay, so you know how we always allude to the corporation having a secret agenda with the aliens, but we never really specify what that is or the scope of it? Yeah. Well, let's just nail that down. It's movie number seven. Let's give them a clear answer. But wouldn't that ruin the mystery? Not if it's good. True, not if it's good. Well, we know the aliens are ultimately just a manifestation of the goo. So why do the humans want the goo? Well, it does weird things to life forms. Maybe Wayland yutani wants to use it to help humanity. That's true, and we're already doing the working class trash heap planet. Let's use the first act to show them how bad these human colonies are. Yeah, everybody's getting sick, it's a nightmare, so just really lean into the suffering. And then, when we eventually reveal Whale and yutanis mission, it's like, oh yeah, that makes sense, these are desperate times. And we connect it all the way back to the Prometheus expedition, because that was the real purpose of it. Peter Whalen wanted to meet the engineers so that he could use their technology to live forever, and this is just a continuation of that. Swag. So our poor people sneak onto the big ship, which is actually a research facility studying the aliens and the goo, and there's a crime scene on the ship. Just carnage, exactly like aliens. We make the audience piece together what happened. Right, and then one of the flavor characters gets face hugged, and then it's on. Yeah, okay, I, I just, I want to be honest here. We've seen the chestburster a million times. Well, yeah, it's a staple of the franchise. We have to do it. I know, but it's more that I know how it works, so I'm tired of seeing new batches of characters learn it for the first time over and over again. But how do we write our way around it? 
Well, it's simple. We just give the characters all of the answers right up front. Well, that's insane. Yeah, but what are they going to do? True. What if we put an old synthetic on the ship who's like torn in half or something, and he was there when things went south originally, so he knows the alien, he knows the life cycle, and he tells the characters so they don't make the same mistakes that alien protagonists always make. I like that. It's like we tell the audience, we don't need the old tricks, we got new ones. Yeah, like how the alien always hides in pipes. What if they just see it and they're like, yo, it's hiding in the pipes. And are we really cementing in canon that there's no way to take a face hugger off without spilling acid blood everywhere? People are smart. What if they freeze it off? Yes, I like what you're saying. On the acid blood note, I don't think we fully explored the ramifications of it since the first movie. Like, it can melt through a ship. That is serious. And since our characters are smart, they're going to be hyper cognizant of that the whole movie. And we should establish those stakes via... Acid death. Acid death, not even a lot. It just drips a guy to death. Okay, so, finale. It's an alien franchise staple to have a fake-out ending and then a second finale later. Right now our finale is the android proves that he's human and a bunch of aliens get killed and he and the girl escape to a better life. But there has to be one more thing. <gasps> the queen. <sighs> now, the queen was like a boss battle set piece. We've done a lot of classic alienisms if our finale is just another reaffirmation of what works, we're kind of selling ourselves short. The goal here is to tell the audience we're going forward with this franchise. I vote we do some creepy human-alien hybrid. Yeah, we already did that. True, you make a compelling point, but what if it was good? Like we have a pregnant lady character who gets the goo inside of her, and then she gives birth to some freaky thing. Yeah, okay. And then we do some crazy shit where the blood melts through the ship, and there's an asteroid belt, and she's in a space suit. Yeah, I think you should just run with this. It sounds like you have a vision. Yeah, and then happy ending. Happy ending. Girl and her robot ride off into the sunset. Roll credits. Wait, is this a... Who put a mic in here? I had a lot of fun with audio in that segment, and if you want to boost your audio editing skills, you need to check out Master Audio Editing in Premiere Pro on Skillshare, the sponsor of today's video. Skillshare is the largest online learning platform for creatives. It's host to thousands of courses ranging from illustration, graphic design, and photography to music, marketing, productivity, and so much more. This is a difficult season of human culture. The world is changing, and the essential skills of 20 years ago might not even be relevant to your life. But fear not, Skillshare is on the ball, offering compact learning experiences designed for creatives by creatives. Industry experts at that. On the vanilla internet, you never know who actually knows their stuff and who doesn't. But Skillshare's courses are curated by real pros, and it really shows. Information is presented efficiently in a way that allows you to learn at your own pace. It's a refreshingly positive and productive learning environment that, in my opinion, you can't get anywhere else online. Skillshare isn't just a platform, it's a community. Did you know that Skillshare members can share their personal projects and get feedback from the Skillshare community? From other people who genuinely care? That's really cool. And the people at Skillshare aren't just committed to improving you, they're committed to improving Skillshare. This platform is constantly evolving and optimizing. There's a brand new new class categorization system to help you find what you need more easily. Space has been made to talk about AI. It's just the little things that show you Skillshare cares. So go into this fall ready to learn it all. The first 500 people to use my link in the description will receive a one month free trial of Skillshare. Get started today. Something that's been on my mind lately is a hypothetical eighth alien movie that brings together OG characters, Romulus characters, and prequel characters. I feel like the groundwork's kind of been laid for it. Though there is a question of should. These are horror films that honor horror genre tropes, especially Romulus. So to do an action-adventure, endgame, space epic, um, even if it was covered in a thorough coat of horror paint, would still sort of go against the genetics of the series in some respects. But I want to see David and Andy fight, so let's work this out. My first decree as mayor is that Alien 3 and Alien Resurrection are decanonized. They did not happen in my hypothetical universe. Meaning, Ripley, Hicks, and Newt are alive and old. Originally I was like, oh yeah, we can just have Rain and Andy bump into the old gang. But after a bit of digging, I realized that Romulus is actually set 37 years before Aliens plural. Sorry, I'm a fake fan. Uh, during the events of Romulus, Ripley is in cryosleep with her cat, and Hicks is a child, so that doesn't work. We can't age down Sigourney Weaver and Michael Bean. I mean, we could, but no. So our movie takes place 40 years after Aliens. We are on the cutting edge of this universe's canon. 
if we want Rain, the protagonist of Alien Romulus, to exist as a 20-something in Alien 8, she has to have done significant time in cryo, otherwise she'd be in her 60s. I'm going to make another decree as mayor and say Rain and Andy did make it to their destination at the end of Romulus. Rain had a full life there and died peacefully amidst a thriving community. Or she's still alive, but played by a different actress, but probably would we'll just say dead for now. Sorry, this is loose. Andy, though, Andy, on the other hand, he hasn't aged a day. And what's even crazier is that he's been living as a human. He's got an adoptive family or something. Occasionally he cuts his finger chopping vegetables and white blood comes out and the kids look at him funny, but he just smirks. He doesn't hide that he's a synthetic, it doesn't even matter. So Andy's just chilling on Planet Happy. He's a leader, people rely on him. Let's look at the other puzzle pieces. What's David up to? Last we saw, he had a mobile lab full of all kinds of toys going to who knows where. But it's been 115 years since Covenant. So what was David doing during those 115 years? My vote is that he spent that time becoming the God Emperor of Space. Because why not? He's the Thanos of this universe. He commands legions of alien monstrosities. He has completely mastered genetics and the black goo. He cruises around space and conquers planet after planet. And guess which planet he lands on in the first act? Planet Happy. So Andy becomes like a Moses figure, leading his people off the planet to a better life. Children who have grown up on Planet Happy their entire lives have to flee as their home is destroyed by horrors beyond their comprehension. I don't think we see David yet. I'm saving him for the midpoint, but he is behind this. So it's Andy and a bunch of humans on a ship. Andy decides that they're going to go to the human central government on Earth. Uh, to warn them and to seek refuge. So all of the humans all go into cryo for a couple of months. Andy spends that time trying to figure out what's happening. He researches something he saw during the invasion, but he doesn't quite get the answers yet. Uh, but he does obtain some crucial piece of evidence which connects this to either the Covenant or David. So Andy knows a thing. So, Andy arrives on Earth where his ship is impounded by Colonial Marines. This is around break into two. And the commandant of the entire Marine Corps is Hicks. Face still melted and everything, same exact personality. He hates formalities, he hates squeezing into his stupid uniform to shake hands with politicians. But he's a bit on edge right now because of the situation. Colonies are going dark, one after another. Nobody knows what's happening. It's been going on for years and people are running back to Earth, causing a massive immigration crisis. Andy tells Hicks what he knows. With the leads Andy provides, he and Hicks deduce that David is involved. As far as Waylon Yutani knows, David disappeared with the Prometheus expedition, never to be seen again. He's ancient history. What little they know about him comes from Peter Waylon's personal journals. Waylon wrote some ominous shit about David, and it's like, okay, this guy is a super freak. But what's next? Now that David and Hicks are buddies, Hicks says he'll pull a few strings and get clearance for Andy's flock of humans to land on Earth, as well as some temporary accommodations. Andy and Hicks part ways. Turns out they're going to be staying with one of Hicks's old friends, none other than Ellen Ripley, the protagonist of the first two films. And is she some cool soldier lady? No. No, she doesn't like violence. She never did. She does humanitarian work. She runs an overpopulation shelter or something. I could probably find some something more appropriate, but yeah. She's just a citizen. Ripley meets Andy. Does she hate him for being a synthetic? No, she already had that arc. They're besties. Everybody gets to eat a nice earth meal, and then they go to bed. But then, in the wee hours of the morning, one of Andy's kids wakes him up. Andy, I don't feel so good. Why? What's wrong? Andy, Andy, I'm scared. <laughs> yeah, turns out all or most of Andy's kids have aliens inside them. David somehow infected them and let them get away. I haven't figured out the details. But yeah, all these kids slowly wake up, sucking their thumbs, crying, panicking, xenomorphs bursting out of them, but like not all at the same time. So they see it happening to their friends and they're like, oh my God, that's going to happen to me. And then it happens to them. This is, God, this is really fucked up. I didn't, re I didn't realize how, I'm, I'm like saying it out loud now, this is really bad. Um, we're just going to go with it. But all this is happening, mind you, on Earth, past clearance. So now there are like 30 Xenos running around the quadrant. Uh, they make it past some like military checkpoint. Earth's defenses start crumbling. Ripley and Andy escape to somewhere safe. They meet up with Hicks. He is like ashamed that this happened under his watch, I would think. But the conversation is cut short when an engineer ship arrives in Earth's orbit. I don't know how David has an engineer ship, but it would be cool, and it seems within his means. Uh, he blows something up, and then he demands to negotiate. We haven't seen his face yet. So I think Hicks, like, takes a little ship alone and goes to negotiate with David. And then, like, 
around page 70, you know, past the midpoint, uh, we finally get our first David scene, and he is crazy, obviously. Maybe he's, like, experimented on himself or something. As for what he wants, well, the precedent for him is kill everyone that seems to be his MO, but he wouldn't have asked to negotiate with Earth leadership if that were the case. So maybe there's something deeper going on. Maybe he's like, you... I demand that you wake up Johnny Utani from his 150-year nap. I need to talk to him. And then Johnny Utani becomes the key to everything because he knows something from David's origins. But then David begins his assault and Ripley and Andy have to do stuff. Set piece, set piece, set piece. Hicks dies. Andy fights David and defeats him with the power of love. All of this sounds very marvel when I say it out loud, but the direction would be one-to-one -one with Romulus. It would still maintain the horror atmosphere. Space travel would remain tedious and clunky. I wouldn't invent stupid new laser technology or anything, although the 40-year time jump does afford some freedoms should they need to be exploited. Hey, here's an idea. Maybe David was just bitter about humans the whole time because he never could be one. There's a lot of stuff you could do. Maybe David comes back as some insane synthetic alien hybrid. Um, and then there's Ripley. While she's a great character with a clear personality, she doesn't exactly slot into the philosophical hullabaloo. I think she needs a new arc with new characters. Uh, what that is, I can't say. Oh yeah, also there are new characters throughout the whole thing, if you want. And we could probably do something with Daniels and Danny, since maybe they were in the pod for a while. I I I'd hate to Elizabeth them, you know, again. And Newt is, I guess, uh, she's, we're gonna make her canonically a teacher on earth that feels right i don't know i'm just snowballing thank you for coming to my pitch what story choices would you make if you were tasked with writing alienate let me know down below good evening lucanators thank you so much oh, oh you see that? You hear that little thing my voice did good evening lucanators we're um driving through the midwest here you're right i didn't do my vocal warm-ups i do 10 reps of screaming into a pillow and then i do 10 reps of oh oh she thinks that i should grow my hair out do you guys want me to grow my hair out like, do you like care girls. you don't know me at all no, you know they, I oh my 26 percent female audience yes. do you guys want me to grow my hair out and because he had like a military haircut and i was like what is going on but like the cur like the curls are coming in. I know I look crazy right now. I know I'm not one to talk right now. Issa, you remember when we saw the Alien movie? Yes. How did you feel about it? Honestly, it just when I I just think about Baby Beetlejuice, <laughs> like that part of Beetlejuice. That's all that comes to my head. Can you summarize the plot of, of the Alien movie? You know that I can. We left after the um, the Yonic apparatus on the wall gives birth to the alien, and then the guy gets acid drip. Because Lucas got so scared, so I had to take him home. That's exactly what happened. Oh, by the way, those are tattoos on her face. That's not makeup. <laughs> Do I, are you scared of me? They're terrified, I'm sure. All right. <laughs> take it easy, y'all.